All right, in this last lecture uh, dedicated to the English uh, Civil War, we're going to pick up uh, in the 1630s and the decade of troubles. And again, we ended the last lecture with the idea of deterioration between the relations between the Crown and the Parliament. And you can see there uh, some of the issues uh, that were involved. And we're going to see that uh, one of the ways that kings uh, tried to collect taxes um, extra legally, that is, without Parliament's consent, uh, was using something called ship money. Um, and so they would levy a tax on coastal towns, um, that, and the money was used then from that tax to build uh, a navy to protect the English coasts and uh, English maritime interests. Uh, and what the kings did was clever. They extended the ship tax that had been just for coastal towns to all towns in England, even those towns that were inland and were not on the water. Uh, and so this was a clear uh, bold move by the kings to raise money without Parliament's consent. Uh, and, and, and you can imagine already then the reaction of Parliament is going to be swift and, and uh, one of, of great anger. So that's, that's kind of, again, to set the stage for this uh, decade of troubles. Um, and we're going to see that uh, as the 1630s progresses, there's no longer a consensus uh, among the members of Parliament the, itself about what was really good and in the best interests of England. Some parliamentary leaders uh, saw the uh, advances of King Charles and the Anglican Church uh, as a Catholic conspiracy, again, to restore elements of popery um, to the English Church and to the English nation. Uh, and, and these members of Parliament tended to see King Charles exercising his royal power in an arbitrary uh, means. Uh, and they felt that this was dangerous and this uh, led towards the idea of tyranny. So we're going to see again the ideas of liberties, uh, of free speech, uh, come into play. Yet some also saw Parliament as acting in ways that were excessive. Um, and uh, the more conservative members of Parliament looked at the more radical members of Parliament and called them sort of the popular spirits. And um, the conservatives saw the popular spirits as uh, failing to respect the traditions and the legitimate rights of royal rule uh, in the English nation. And the conservatives accused these um, radicals, who were typically Puritans, uh, so we have a religious element there, as, as trying to achieve greater popularity among the English people. So we're going to introduce an element of popularity into this equation uh, in Parliament. And again, it's the Puritans that are going to be behind these uh, efforts um, really to question and to challenge the king's uh, authority and prerogative to rule. Uh, now, post-1629, there is no parliament, however. Um, so there, there's no reform uh, or place for these discussions about uh, what was good for the English nation to occur. Uh, and King Charles and um, increasingly uh, uh, Bishop Laud, uh, Archbishop Laud, uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, are going to begin to rule uh, in, in ways that are considered to be uh, excessive. And so while Parliament doesn't meet, at least the groups and factions uh, uh, that made up Parliament are in fact meeting. Uh, they're meeting in London and uh, they are very much uh, concerned about the, the way things are going. And at this point, I think it's also true, uh, and we can uh, look at this uh, time period, uh, we'll get there, uh, rather, let me go back to the troubles, that King Charles began to confirm some of his worst tendencies um, starting in 1629. And I already talked about this idea of ship money, this uh, recourse to extra legal means of taxation. Um, and that was going to cause uh, problems. Um, now, uh, uh, and the ship tax is something that I already uh, discussed, in fact. Now, the legality of the ship money was going to be challenged in the courts um, by John Hamden, uh, who was a member of Parliament, who was a Puritan, and, and the courts at that time found in favor of the king and the courts uh, recognized the legality of the ship tax that was, again, as I said, applied to all towns, whether they were on the coast or not. Um, now, what, what really is, uh, so Charles is able to continue uh, collecting taxes without Parliament. What's really going to tip the situation back towards Parliament 
is when King Charles got mixed up over the problem of religion. So we're back to that problem of religion that just does not want to go away. Uh, and, and that's an interesting uh, thing, right? So um, King Charles was devout. He was intolerant. He wanted all subjects to uh, pray and behave as he did or as he thought they should. And he really didn't uh, have any time for uh, challenges to uh, that in the religious area, in the religious realm. So he promoted, that is, King Charles promoted a series of Anglican priests to become new bishops in the Church of England. And their mission was to persecute the Puritans, who had grown more numerous among the merchant classes and had become a majority in the House of Commons. Now, again, the House of Commons isn't in session at this point, but again, the Puritans are uh, numerous, and um, and Charles really wants to put a stop to the spread of Puritanism. So in 1637, Charles and his Archbishop Laud, William Laud, uh, tried to impose a system of bishops uh, up in Scotland. And remember that uh, King Charles is not only the King of England, but he's also the King of Scotland. Scotland had a, a Calvinist church, and the Calvinist church, again, is based on the rule of elders, and each church itself was an independent, autonomous body. And so, uh, and Charles and, and Laud impose a system of bishops, that is, top-down hierarchical control of the church in Scotland. And this led to a very fierce uh, uh, Scottish rebellion. And the Scots, in fact, elected a representative assembly that drew up uh, a, a national covenant. And that was a statement of religious principles in February of 1638. Then in November of 1638, the Covenanters abolished the system of bishops imposed by Charles and Archbishop Laud. And at this point, both sides, that is, the king and the Scots, began gearing up for war. But Charles had no army because he had no money because there was no parliament. So over the next couple of years, by 1640, Charles realizes that his extra legal means of raising money through the ship tax and other other minor taxes that he was able to collect were not sufficient to his need for a major army to deal with the threat of Scottish rebellion. So in 1640, uh, early in 1640, Charles summoned Parliament back into session after an 11-year absence to raise funds for the war uh, that seemed imminent against the Scots. Uh, Parliament, however, uh, as it had done in 1628 1629, uh, challenged the king, demanding that the king recognize a long list of grievances, both political and religious, before they would authorize any money for the king and the army to defend the nation against the Scots. Charles, however, refused to negotiate, and he dismissed Parliament once again. And here we go back to the question of personality. Uh, Charles is inflexible. Charles is not going to be like uh, Queen Elizabeth, who was able to uh, uh, work towards uh, settlements, that is, the politique position, or again, to use Machiavelli's idea of the fox, knowing when and how to work with opponents to get what you need and to arrive at the, uh, the outcome you need. Charles didn't have that, uh, and he's going to insist on his royal uh, uh, rule, that is, his sovereign power, and that is going to, again, cause trouble. Uh, and so Charles dismisses Parliament in early 1640, and this was known as the Short Parliament. Uh, however, at that very same time, the Scottish Covenanters, Covenanters rather, invaded Northern England, and they defeat the English army as it was uh, at the Battle of Newburn in the summer of 1640. Uh, so I think it's clear that uh, without uh, adequate funds, the English army was not in a, in a very strong position. It was uh, made up really of the, the great noble families who supported the crown, uh, and they're defeated by the Scottish. And at this point, Charles uh, had no choice but to recall Parliament uh, once again. So the story, uh, this endless sort of calling Parliament, dismissing Parliament again, something I'll call a tug of war, continues. And at this point, Parliament's going to meet from 1640 to 1660 uh, without being dismissed, and this is going to be known as the Long Parliament. Now, the, the Parliament that met uh, after the summer of 1640 um, 
is not going to be kind or sympathetic to King Charles's requests. In fact, Parliament's going to move to arrest um, several of Charles' key allies and supporters, and one in particular uh, is the Earl of Strafford, who had been the Lord Governor of Ireland, and uh, he was recalled to England to help organize the English army to defeat the Scots. Parliament's also going to arrest and put on trial Archbishop William Laud for his uh, um, attempts to reintroduce Catholic elements um, both in Scotland and in England. And again, now we see the problem of religion, the problem of finances, the problem of, of foreign policy all coming back. Um, now, the Earl of Stratford was tried for treason by Parliament on very thin evidence. There really wasn't much evidence, but they convict him anyway, which tells you the mood of Parliament, and it's an angry mood. Charles tries to organize a rescue mission to free the Earl of Stratford, but the plan was discovered and the, the, the plot was foiled. And this really caused Charles some problems uh, among his loyal supporters, who now really doubt him, and are not sure about Charles' uh, position uh, and, and reliability at this point. Parliament then has Stratford executed for treason uh, in May of 1641. Um, and at this point, uh, Charles signed a bill that declared Parliament could not be dissolved without its own consent. Uh, and this, again, is a major concession that Charles was forced to make uh, after the uh, execution of his loyal supporter, Earl, the Earl of Stratford, and again, desperately needing funds uh, to raise an English army uh, to defend itself against the Scots. So Charles signs this bill, again, declaring Parliament could not be dissolved without its own consent. And again, this goes back to the question of royal power. Now it seems like Parliament is going to uh, uh, really uh, claim more power in, in its own right. And one of the king's ancient prerogatives, that is the ability to dissolve Parliament, uh, has now been taken away. And this is a pretty serious limitation on the king's powers. And I think that's the part of the story here is uh, as the king loses power, right, uh, Parliament gains power, so uh, there's no destruction of power, there's just simply a shift or transference of power. Now, in the May of 1641, uh, 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 after the execution of the Earl of Stratford, um, the religious radicals in Parliament put forth a petition known as the Root and Branch Bill. And this really kind of threatened to upset the situation in, in Parliament, as the radicals in the Root and Branch Bill propose ending all bishops uh, in the Church of England, so doing away with the hierarchical structure, and then allowing each congregation to select its own minister. Um, and that was going to be a serious challenge to, again, the religious question and the religious policy that King Charles had adopted. Remember, Bishop Laud has been arrested at this point, um, and so this is, a, a, you know, really kind of a moment of crisis for King Charles and the Crown. Now, uh, in response, um, there, there was going to be a showdown. Uh, when we have the root and branch bill that, uh, again, Parliament puts forth this idea of ending all bishops, yet there's a, a, an Irish rebellion that breaks out. The Catholics of Ireland uh, began a rebellion in October of 1641, uh, and there was a great fear then of renegade Catholics uh, who were reported to have slaughtered innocent Protestants in Ireland, and then there was this fear that there was going to be a major Catholic conspiracy, not only in Ireland, but that it would spread back to England. So there's always this underlying fear, uh, again, at times stoked by the imaginations of the Habsburgs in Spain, uh, trying to uh, invade England and restore the Catholic Church. Uh, and at this point, uh, Parliament has to respond to the Catholic rebellion in Ireland. And they do so, and they took um, some extraordinary measures. Um, uh, and we'll get to um, some of that. Uh, the House of Commons, uh, at this point led by Puritan leader John Pym, uh, demanded that Charles employ only counselors approved by Parliament. And this kind of sounds like a, advice and consent of the United States Senate, uh, so that when presidents appoint uh, ambassadors or appoint Supreme Court justices or appoint uh, secretaries to cabinet positions, all things we're uh, witnessing today. Um, 
the, the, the Senate has to provide this consent, advice and consent, and this is exactly what the House of Commons is claiming in 1641. Um, now, again, uh, Charles is going to react negatively to this, saying that uh, these are uh, unconstitutional uh, measures. Um, the parliament also claimed that it was going to take control of the English militias, uh, and therefore we're going to see parliament taking over as, if you will, commander-in-chief of the English army. This power had always belonged to the king, always been the king's prerogative as the uh, head of the uh, English state, the English armies, and now Parliament is going to try to wrest control away of the army from the king. Again, Charles refuses these uh, uh, measures uh, by Parliament as unconstitutional, and Charles begins to claim that he alone has the sacred duty to defend the fundamental laws of England against the radical renegades in Parliament. And accordingly, January of 1642, Charles is going to issue the arrest warrants for five Puritan leaders in, parliaments on, on, in Parliament on charges of high treason. Uh, and so Charles is going to try to go right into the heart of the matter, arrest the parliamentary Puritan leaders, remove them, in an attempt to reestablish his, what he felt, constitutional role as the supreme sovereign. And again, we have this tug of war. Now, the Puritan leaders in Parliament uh, were forewarned. They fled Parliament. Uh, and at this point, it's really interesting because Charles is forced to leave London, that is, flee London, because angry crowds of Londoners had begun to surround the king's palace, uh, and they had been obviously inflamed by the Puritan leaders, and so there, there, there are these agitators, Puritan parliamentary leaders agitating the crowds uh, and people of London, uh, who actually forced Charles to flee London uh, uh, and, and take residence up in the countryside. And it's at this point that Parliament uh, is going to um, begin to make preparations um, for war. And what they do in 1642 is pass something called the Militia Ordinance. And again, I had already mentioned that Parliament is claiming uh, control over the, the militia, that is the Army of England. And in 1642, they passed the formal ordinance called the Militia Ordinance that created a parliamentary army. Uh, and this is something really new. This is uh, a bold and new move where Parliament actually has its own army loyal to Parliament not to the king, not to the English nation. And the, um, the soldiers that were part of the parliamentary army are known uh, by the title, uh, by this name, uh, they're called Round Heads. Um, and it's apparently because they uh, shaved their hair uh, uh, as a, a way to distinguish themselves from uh, those that fought for the royal army, who typically were uh, of noble extraction, uh, had much longer hair. So uh, hairstyle, believe it or not, becomes a way to distinguish uh, who you're fighting for, uh, whether you're fighting for parliament, you're a roundhead, uh, and the king and his army uh, um, are known as the cavaliers. Uh, so they're the, the nobility, the upper crust of society. Um, and it's really at this point then that we see parliament coming to believe that it had the sacred duty to represent the interests of the people more than the king. So we see the tug of war. Uh, and, and this idea that Parliament takes, the position that Parliament takes, really goes back to those ideas that we saw first in the French uh, religious wars. Ideas advanced by Theodore Beza, Philippe de Mornay, Francois Hotman, uh, and that is that the people have a right to resist a bad king, a king who behaves in a tyrannical way and does not represent the interest and promote the interest of the people. And so, a king who violates this sacred, if you will, contract, and we'll talk more about contracts when we talk about Hobbes and Locke, uh, uh, have the right and the duty to rebel. And, and Parliament really takes this up uh, in a very serious way. It's not just words on paper and pamphlets and speeches in Parliament. Now Parliament has an army, and they intend to use that army. And of course now the king uh, also has a problem. He's got this rebellion uh, in his own 
kingdom that he has to deal with. And that's going to lead to uh, the, the idea of the Civil War. Now, another thing that, uh, um, and as I mentioned, I forgot to mention, the uh, parliamentary assertion of its rights is going to be known um, as the Grand Remonstrance of 1641. And it's just a, a, a fabulously long document in which Parliament compiled a, a, a host of grievances that had been accumulating over the years. Uh, and, and this is what's going to be the final straw that broke the back, where King Charles really uh, refuses uh, the Grand Remonstrance, and we see the two sides then uh, gearing up for uh, open conflict. Uh, and that's what's going to happen. Um, so you can see here the uh, picture of King Charles in Parliament. Uh, uh, he wanted to arrest the five leaders of the Puritans, but they had already fled. Angry crowds of Londoners forced Charles to flee, and in 1642 we have uh, the war. Uh, and here's a map of England uh, on the left, uh, 1643, and then on the right in 1645. And I think you can see the areas uh, controlled by uh, Parliament uh, in that lighter green. Uh, the areas uh, that are orange are controlled by the king. Uh, and you can see um, what's going to happen eventually is the uh, areas um, controlled by Parliament are far greater than those controlled by the king. So. The Civil War is actually going to lead to uh, the parliamentary military forces defeating the royal military forces. Now, it's true that Parliament controlled the richer, more populated areas of England to the south and east of London, as well as the port towns, while the king controlled the northern and western parts of England, including Wales. Now, it's true that Charles had the better trained fighting force with more experienced officers, but Charles also uh, uh, delayed in attacking Parliament's forces. Uh, and, and there's some question as to why he delayed, why he didn't press uh, war immediately to uh, uh, try to attack Parliament's forces before they had time to organize and train. Yet he doesn't. He delays. And that delay proved to be costly because Parliament was able to raise money, uh, uh, equip its army, and train its army. Um, and that's something that it does, and the Parliament's also able to uh, conclude an alliance with the Scots called the Solemn League and Covenant in 1643. And so Parliament, with its Scottish allies, uh, presents a formidable fighting force, uh, and there's going to be a, a major uh, battle in 1644 at Marston Moor. Uh, that results in the defeat of the king. Um, and the king then um, lost control of northern England. In 1645, after the Battle of Marston Moor, the Parliament reorganized its army into what was known as the New Model Army, led by Thomas Fairfax and Oliver Cromwell, a name you need to be aware of. And they are going to completely crush Charles's uh, cavalier forces at the Battle of Naseby in 1645. So there are two battles, both go badly for the king, and in 1646 uh, uh, Charles uh, flees to Scotland, where he's still king, yet the Scots, because of their religious differences uh, and their, their uh, animosity towards uh, uh, Charles, it's not going to be uh, necessarily a safe haven. And then from 1646 to 1649, there was sort of a state of disorder and confusion in the English nation. Um, I guess the idea is nobody really thought that the parliamentary forces would be able to defeat the king's forces. So there's this sudden and unexpected victory on the side of parliament. And then the question is, well, now what? What do we do? Uh, king Charles is still the king. Uh, and there were some in parliament that wanted to actually restore Charles to his throne, though with restrictions on his uh, authorities. There were others, however, the more radical members of parliament, uh, who wanted to uh, do away with the uh, monarchy uh, uh, in, in, in a series of anti-monarchical reforms. Uh, and this, this more radical uh, uh, group of, of parliamentarians uh, and 
parliamentary army uh, members were known as the levelers. That is, they wanted to level English society. They wanted to do away with the ideas of class differences and create a more egalitarian democratic society. So when we talk about the Civil War, we've already talked about uh, the idea of free speech. We've already talked about the idea of liberties. We've talked about the right of resistance to bad kings. Uh, and, and now we're seeing this new strain injected into this whole discourse, and that is the idea of, of a more democratic spirit that really hadn't existed in, in Europe. Uh, and, and we're now talking about on a nationwide level, so not in a small commune, uh, uh, in an Italian city-state, for example, but now we're talking about the nation of England. So we have this, this, this cauldron of ideas that is kind of bubbling uh, from 19, 1646, rather, to 1649. Now, um, during the, um, so here's a map of the Battle of Naseby, uh, and, and this led to the defeat of King Charles's uh, army, uh, and the question then is what to do after this Battle of Naseby. Um, do we settle with the king, or do we abolish the king? And, and so during the, si the winter of 1646-1647, Parliament actually votes to dis ban the army and negotiate a settlement with King Charles. And I think you can see this uh, politique idea coming back into play that uh, it's far better to resolve differences through negotiated settlements rather than opt for more radical solutions. And, and after all, people uh, of England had always had a king. And so the idea of not having a king was rather foreign. So these traditions don't die easily. Yet at this point, the levelers refused to negotiate a settlement with the king, and the leveler faction actually uh, um, abducts the king, uh, and they hold him uh, prisoner. Uh, <clears throat> and at this point, um, there's, uh, again, a lot of uh, infighting among the factions of parliament between the uh, Puritans, the levelers, and the more conservative uh, factions. Um, now, at this point, Charles is able to escape uh, <laughs> his uh, imprisonment, um, and he uh, again escapes back to Scotland, uh, and he organizes a, a force uh, that uh, people still loyal to him, which there were. He organizes another force. The English, uh, the parliamentary army has to come back into uh, uh, existence, come back to the field of battle. And once again, the English uh, uh, um, uh, army is, the, the parliamentary army that is, is going to defeat the Scottish army that had rallied around uh, King, King Charles. Um, and at this point, Charles again is prisoner. At this point, we still have the parliament trying to uh, uh, figure out what they're going to do with the king, with the monarchy. And again, uh, the moderates want to restore him to the throne with restrictions on his uh, authorities. The radical faction, however, at this point, decides in 1648 that they want to put Charles on trial uh, with a charge of high treason. Now, that that idea was very unpopular in Parliament. Um, and so this, this is what happened. Uh, elements of the Parliament Parliamentary Army, the New Model Army, led by its commander, Oliver Cromwell, actually moved against Parliament and removed all the moderate and conservative parliamentary members from Parliament. They were essentially uh, kicked out of Parliament by Parliament's own army led by Oliver Cromwell. So the radicals are going to take control using the army to do it, uh, and the, the, the remaining parliamentary members are going to actually vote uh, um, to put King Charles on trial uh, for charges of high treason. This parliament was known as the Rump Parliament, that is, those remaining after the purge of parliament. Uh, the Rump Parliament is actually going to put him on uh, King Charles on trial. They're going to find him guilty. And it, King Charles is actually executed, and we'll watch scenes of this from the, the film called Cromwell on January 30th, 1649. Now, never before had a reigning sovereign in Europe been put on trial for a charge of treason, found guilty, and then executed for treason. Kings across Europe and across the centuries had been the human embodiment of law and order, and their authority was widely understood to have derived from God. 
this idea of divine right rule. And, and I think we have to go back to that idea that we encountered much earlier this year, and that's the great chain of being, where you have God and you have God's angels, and then on earth you have God's representatives, whether it be the Pope or the kings. Um, and so the question is, if Charles, as a rightful, lawful king of England, <clears throat> who is God's representative on earth, uh, it, 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 how can he be guilty of treason, that is, uh, violating the laws of a nation, when in fact the king represents the laws, is the embodiment, uh, the physical embodiment of the laws, so how can he be charged of treason? And this is something that Charles actually argued uh, quite vociferously uh, in vain in his defense during his trial. Um, yet the Rump Parliament, led by the Puritans and Oliver Cromwell, believed that there was a higher law, a higher law than a divinely uh, anointed king. And what is that higher law then? Well, the Puritans uh, uh, put forth this idea, this argument that there's the law of the people. Uh, and that law of the people bound a king uh, um, to protect and promote the interest of the people over all else. Um, so what the Parliament uh, and the Puritans in Parliament, again, religious faction, do is they reformulate uh, the idea of, of uh, royal rule, royal power in Europe, uh, taking it from divine right and taking it to uh, uh, a more modern view of sovereignty, and that is that sovereignty rests with the people and that kings have a so sacred obligation uh, uh, to represent the people. And that's a major shift. Um, it's really, I think, critical. Uh, and, and it's why we should know about the uh, uh, English Civil War uh, that I asked all the way back in Lecture 1 in that essential question. Why should we know this, um, besides the fact that it might be on the AP exam? Well, I think this is why, because now we see a, a, a really big shift, a seismic shift in the reformulation of uh, political arrangements and power arrangements, um, the elevation of the people and its uh, representative body that's parliament. So, and, and historians call this the political nation. So I think we have here, really, uh, for the first time, the birth of the political nation. Uh, and in fact, the king actually loses his head. That's no joke. Uh, the king was executed. And with the execution, uh, they're not only executing King Charles, the individual king, but they're also, I think the Puritans in, in many ways are executing the institution of divine right rule. Um, and that's going to send shudders uh, across Europe, and there are going to be re reactions to this that are obviously negative from the king's point of view. And we're going to see how uh, in, in France, uh, the kings there uh, use this event in many ways to uh, reinforce the idea of divine right rule and, 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 and go you know, all in to defend def divine right rule. And they're actually quite successful in France. So uh, very unsuccessful in England uh, and quite successful in France. So there are going to be uh, some pretty interesting differences that we see emerge. And we're going to see other areas of Europe. Uh, we, we see Russia that will emerge. Uh, we'll see the state of Prussia that will emerge. And we already know about Spain and, and Austria, the Habsburgs, that are going to really try to hold on to this idea of divine right rule. Whereas England, the island, uh, is going to go in a very different direction. And I think that's the importance of, of this time period. So with that, I will end this lecture and again if you have any questions and at this point I hope if you were able to listen to these lectures that the context that the uh, ideas and issues and uh, challenges presented uh, dealing with all of those problems of royal rule will help make the uh, reading easier but also help you uh, understand really this momentous shift uh, uh, that occurred in England and, and some of this should be familiar to you from uh, your own knowledge of American history uh, in our own revolution in the 1760s and the 1770s. Uh, many of these ideas will uh, come come to light again and, and drive the American Revolutionary War to its conclusion in the birth of the United States. So I think there's some direct connections that we can make here. So uh, again, any questions, uh, love to have them in class. Thank you very much.